my name is Rasil Valinio, and one of the one of the reasons why I wanted to go last is actually because what I'm going to be talking about is mostly like a case sample. It's like where I'm going to be like going down of what Sherry presented in the morning and what Lalita has presented to us right now. Um, I'm going to be mostly talking about um, Latino, Latinas, and Latinx communities, specifically looking about Mexicans in Minnesota. Who, I just want to raise, like, if you can raise your hand, who has been aware um, of the Latinos um, here in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, in the Twin Cities? Who has gone to Lake Street? What have you, one or two people, what have you observed? In Lake Street, fast food. Fast food. what kind of fast food? The best food. Is fast like it's fast Mexican food? It, yeah, the tacos. When you go to taco to taco taxi, there, yeah, tamales de loma, good tamales right there. What else? What else have you seen in Lake Street besides the best fast food and not so fast food in that area? Drug traffic. Drug traffic. Actually, yes, that was actually the like in the powder horn area that used to be like the most of the idea a lot of drug trafficking, a lot of violence, a lot of there was a lot of gang problems. Who have seen Mercado Central? Who knows about Mercado Central? Who knows about what Mercado Central used to be before it was Mercado Central in 2004 when it changed? You know, a little bit. I it, it was just kind of a rundown um, area, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was one of the most trafficked crack houses yeah. mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. And Mercado Central, actually, it was one of the spots of a lot of danger. Mm -hmm. A lot of violence, a lot of killings almost every day occurred around that area. Shootings, any hour, it was like you were standing here, shooting was going there. No, immediately. So what happened in 2004? Actually, Mexicanos, we started arriving. So what started happening? People were actually living in the most dangerous area in, this, in, the, in Powderhorn, in the area of Minneapolis. Why? Because it was the cheapest place to live. No one wanted to live there because that was the stigma. That was where you could afford to, to rent a house without any social security number, where you can actually not be constantly persecuted because you will fall into the cracks. You will be hiding, you will be fighting, hiding behind the shadows. We're hiding behind the shadows still, but at that time, we were being not perceived. You ask people, are there Mexicans in Minnesota? They, the, 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 you, they were like, no, of course not. What were they doing way up there in Minnesota? Ironically, we have a history since the early, in the early 1900s. And we've had, this is our third wave of migration. I identify as Mexicana because I was, I'm a Mexicana. I'm from the state of Morelos, where almost 73% of the Mexicans who live here are from this, this state. So, and a majority of the population that they arrived to, is the, to Minnesota, they came of the ages of 14 to 19. It's what we can call right now undocumented underage at that moment, they were just called migrants. That was it. There was not this big title that now we can see in the media, that they are seen everywhere, who are unfortunately in camps, you know? and that they're being hidden, and now they're really being hidden, not behind the shadows, but behind the tents. But that's another topic. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't want to deviate. <laughs> so when Mercosin, when Lake Street, the Powderhorn area, started to actually become more, I can never pronounce this word, revitalized, ha, <laughs> <laughs> I did it, revitalized. Things actually started getting changing around there. We can start seeing this kind of paintings. I love it. Right now, unfortunately, it's not more there. It's, it's actually now it's a beautiful brown building. In the past, it used to be this gorgeous mural. And who can tell me, what images can you see in the mural? Eagles, Eagles. Flag. flag, we have two flags, the Mexican flag, the U.S. flag, the two eagles, <coughs> the U.S. eagle and the Mexican eagle. Hmm. And we have two quite symbolic ladies, oh, yeah. the Statue of Liberty and our Angel of Independence. Hmm. So this actually brings 
both countries together. As much apart as we are geographically speaking, we're actually linked. Now there is a constant flow, not only of people, but of goods, of ideas. There. Of ideas, of even imaginaries, of how we remember the idea of home. Who has not left their home? Who has not left like their, even like when you go on a trip, a two week trip, a, a three week trip, a couple of months, a year, five years, six years, 10 years, you feel homesick. You miss your food. You miss your family. You miss, you miss your weather. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, so Morelos is, is actually, it's really warm. Like, it's actually Cuernavaca, the capital of the city, of the state, is called the City of Eternal Spring. Mm -hmm. Colors everywhere. Mm -hmm. And what the majority of the population actually lives here uh, is from the municipalities. Southeast, and it's going to be quite difficult to remember these names, so it's okay, Paso Chapan and Tepalcingo. It's actually, there's no way that you actually get cold. If I will be wearing this sweater, and over, that, over there, I will be sweating. I will not, I'm sorry, I will not be able to breathe because it's so warm. When you come here, if you're wearing this sweater outside, it will freeze. <laughs> so there's the other side, you know? You have to learn how to transform your life when you come here. So that's why when you walk around Lake Street, you find so many beautiful murals. That way, that way you don't actually get homesick that much. This is some fun data that I'm not gonna read, You'll be there, you can see it. But Minnesota, it's actually, and the state of Morelos, there are actually two quite hidden actors within migration. Because Minnesota, the state of Minnesota is, has, been, has not been seen as your traditional migrant receiver mm -hmm. area. No one will think, it's like, yeah, there are migrants in Minnesota. Why are they going there? Mexico, from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Usually you go to California, mm -hmm. next to Mexico, Texas, o sea, all, o sea, all that Arizona, all of them. Why do they go way up there to Minnesota? Why do you think they come to Minnesota? It's not the weather. <laughs> the families that came here earlier. Like... Yeah, what, but what did their families came here? Uh, for the, um, the stockyards and trust and fall, as well as um, doing um, the Something, and something else. Mining. Mining. Meatpacking. Meatpacking. Mm -hmm. Sugar beet industry. Sugar beets, yeah. What else? What do we have that's really big that's in Minnesota? Now you can take a light rail there directly. Mall exactly. Mall of America. Who's working in Mall of America? What kind of faces do you see when you work in Mall, when they are cleaning in Mall of America? Prepping your food in Mall of America. In the restaurants in Mall of America, in the restaurants around here, mm -hmm. Twin City Grills, Georgia the Dragon, El Chino Latino, Mexicanos, and from what state? Morelos. Mm -hmm. Almost, and in the hotel that we're staying, every single person who's actually working in that hotel, in the Marriott, they're from Morelos. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, I entered, I checked in, I was the, the woman, she just opened the door and I was like, Raciel. I was like, whoa. <laughs> it was like a flashback for 15 years ago when I met her downtown in the town that she's originally from. Oh my God. I walk in the street in Lake Street because I've been working in this community since 2004. I know almost a lot, not everyone because I'm not that popular, <laughs> but I know a lot of the people that are there. So it's like, there's a little big large community of Morelenses here. And yes, the traditional service, they're in the certain meat pack industry, in the railroad, in the mining, in the farming, but number one, what these young people came to live here was because of the service sector. Was that people who are cooking our foods. In almost every single restaurant that we go, they're working us, they're working here. Indian, Thai, the specialty is actually is the Asian food. That's why when you go downtown, well, downtown, way downtown in Mexico, um, in the small little towns, the best Asian food you can find is in these towns. Mm -hmm. Thai food. 
and well, of course, red French food and Italian food, pasta made out of scratch. The best like fresh food vegetables that you can get because they pick it. They actually buy it from their parents and prepare it for you. So when you talk to them, um, when you talk to them, you see them that they, they're actually just presenting like this, this like really smiley face because when they're cleaning your room, when they're cooking your food, they're actually not they're there. It is not usually their first job that they're doing on the day. They actually are working for 16, 18 hours straight. They have two jobs, sometimes three jobs. In their free time, they're actually working. Why? Not only because they have to is this, send money back home, but because they have to sustain themselves. They have to pay a rent because most of them, they don't, if they're lucky enough, they can have enough time here, have bills on their name without the fear of being persecuted. I wonder if I underline that, that word, fear. Fear, fear, fear. The fear of being persecuted. If you don't have a social security number, if you don't have an IT number that's for paying your taxes, you're not, you're no one here. You're an invisible person in the legal aspect. That's why a lot of the population actually went to Lake Street and Powderhorn area to live because they can live three, four, six people in a two bedroom apartment, share the rent because that's gonna be not as expensive. That way you can share the bills and only there's, there can only be in the name of one person who's the most vet, like brave one to give their name and their information to a landlord or a landlady that you know if something goes wrong they will come for him or her, and you will not be persecuted. So there's this constant fear, this constant surveillance. And that's very similar to almost every single brown face, you know, is the PTSD of like, of like being stopped, being persecuted all the time. So actually my talk is not gonna be only of the presence of Mexicanos in the Twin Cities. It's about the impact that it has on their mental health because we never think about when we see a migrant, when we see a person who has displaced him or her, herself to a different country. What is the mental aspect? What is the health, the endurance, all the trauma that it has caused, and that it has caused him or her? Not, we're not, I'm not talking only about the crossing of the border. I'm not talking about the three, four, five days walking in the desert. I'm not talking about saying goodbye to your mom and dad and not knowing if you're gonna see him or her ever again, because you don't know when you're gonna go back home. I'm not talking about that. We all heard about those horror stories. I hope we all have, because it's important. No, but what I'm gonna be talking about is when the people who live here, what happens? What is the impact on their mental health? No, because we don't talk about them. We don't talk about that topic. And I'm saying, as Mexican, we don't talk about that topic. You know, like mental health, uh -uh, that doesn't exist. You know, if you go to a therapist, that, that means that you're crazy. You know, I was like, no, no, no. So what do you do? What do you, how even when you sit down with your friends, with your compadre, with your comadre, sorry, I, I use a lot of words in Spanish. It just comes innate. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're talking with your comadre, your compadre, what is it that you talk about? What is it that you talk about? And usually, is about home. It's usually about what you miss, you know? And sometimes you have it with a beer, or two beers, or three beers. Mm -hmm. After the fifth beer, you start talking about, oh, do you know that so-and-so got deported? Do you know that so-and-so actually is actually in the detention center? And there's humor all around. Humor all the time, because that's the only way of coping. It's like, well, at least now he doesn't have to work. Mm -hmm. He just wakes up and has warm milk, you know, and some beans and rice. And the other one is like, actually, they don't give him beans and rice. They just give him this bread. He's like, ugh, bread. They don't know how to eat with bread. Tortillas, you know, joking. Trying to find joke as like the comic relief. Because if you tell the truth, the blunt truth is depressing. That's why, that's why the, that's why the, 
it has actually increased. I'm just showing images about Lake Street. It's my favorite street in Lake Street. In this area. So I think that because it's a hard topic to talk, so I'm just showing beautiful images. You know. Um, so the idea of you know just being happy, relaxed, going back from work after having two jobs, you know, working straight for 18 hours, not sleeping, and just going home and not talking about, you know, sad things. Like, I haven't seen my mom in 10 years, and she's sick. I cannot go back. She cannot come here. If I go back, I know I'm never coming back here to the States, no? And I may never see my mom. Facebook, based Facebook, live stream, WhatsApp, as a magical app that now has appeared it has revolutionized the way to contact with family. No, it's like if you don't WhatsApp someone, it, it, no, it's bad. And they know that you have WhatsApp, and they have family <laughs> chats. And if you're answering a family chat, you're in a dog house. So even that thing, no, it's like how technology has actually been part of feeling yourself as an outsider, but as an insider. No, how if we read the definition given by, I, have, I hate reading, but I have to read this because I didn't memorize it. Um, the definition of mental health by the National Institute of Mental Health in the US is, tell me if migrants, any migrants, documented or undocumented, Mexicans or non-Mexicans, fulfill it. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel and act. It also helps determine how we, we, we handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. Mental health is important at, very sta at every stage of life, from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. Over the course of your life, if you experience mental health problems, you think, mood, and behavior could be affected. Many factors to mental health problems are, in are included include biological factors such as genes or brain chemistry. The next one. Life experiences such as trauma or abuse. And the last one, family history of mental health problems. Who can tell me if everyone who has moved, been displaced, willingly or unwillingly, has not suffered the second part the, of, the, like, of, the, of the factors of mental health? That is life experiences such as trauma or abuse. That's one of the normal, one of the number one aspects of mental health, trauma or abuse. Because you have suffered abuse in your labor, in your work, when you know that you're gonna be working in your in the kitchen, because that's where mostly work where they work, in the kitchen, for working for eight hours, ten hours straight. And you know that you're going to be paid five, six dollars an hour without any benefits, without any like if something if you are injured and work, you're not going to get any. It's like you're not going to get any healthcare. The healthcare is like put a bandaid, put water, and go and work. Just make sure that blood doesn't run into food. Just do it. No. And to expect it to be disposable too. So how? That's the word disposable. Migrant bodies are disposable. If you get sick, next one. If you get sick, next one. If ice comes to get you, next one. So what does the, the what does that do to the person? If if I was in that place, I would be crying in the corner of the of depression. People that are here, they don't have that possibility to go crying in the corner, no, because they have to think not of themselves or their family back homes. The promise, the sacred promise that they did to their mom. I'm leaving mom. Sorry, Jenny, you're gonna be my mom. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm mom, I'm leaving. I don't know when I'll be back, no? But I promise that I'm gonna build your house. I promise that I'm gonna send you money every month. That way, you will take care of my dad. You will buy the piece of land that I promise you. That way, my little brother doesn't have to migrate like I did. No? That way, my little sister doesn't have to marry when she's 14, 15, because she cannot go to school anymore. And that way, her husband will help her, will not help, will not, you know, um, will 
you know, it will, she will, he will be responsible for her. No, I'll be, I'll be the provider. Me, your son of 16 years old. I cannot imagine myself being 16 years old and telling my mom, I'm coming back, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving and I, know, I don't know when I'll be back. No, literally. Because I don't know if I'm, I'll be make it, I'll make it crossing the border. So when you come here, you're carrying all that burden. Not burden, but yes, in that way it's burden. Because you're carrying that promise, that sacred promise that you did for your mom. And that you know that it might not be the first or the last time that, um, that you're gonna be present, no? That you're gonna be here in this town doing the celebrations. That's why there's been a lot of coping mechanisms in this city. That way, a lot of people are depressed. And as I said in the beginning, joking or not joking, in our culture, in Mexican culture, in Latino culture, I'm just gonna put that example because that's the best one I know. We don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about depression. Because A, depression, even that's an illness that is middle upper class urban communities. If you go lower class in Mexico or in a rural communities, there are other illnesses similar to what we can consider depression. But depression per se, we're not medicalized there yet. So you can be seen as sadness, you're sad, no? Or you're just feeling some, what's that? something else, but that's not depression. No, you're, it, will, it will pass. Just take a tea, it will pass, no? Go and cry a little bit. Go and, have a, go, and, go and be in a celebration. Go and be in a party. No, it will pass. And also within your, what can be seen as group therapy in the States or in middle urban class, in upper classes in urban settings in Mexico, in small communities, is basically gossip. You go in the middle of the town and you gossip. That is your therapy. Because you know what Juanita is happening because of Susanita did this, and where my son is actually drinking a lot, what do I do? That's a coping mechanism in rural communities. Here, there's no time for gossip. Time is money. If you sit down and gossip, haha, <laughs> that is like 10 bucks that didn't, that didn't go into your pocket. Those 10 bucks translated into pesos. Right now it's 200 pesos. That's what a person earns a day in Mexico, a day. Working day and night, a day. And those 200 pesos, those $10, means that your sister is not gonna have enough money to go to school for the next week. You have no time to think about that. So what do we do here? What do we do in Mexicans in Minnesota? We cannot get depressed because we can afford to get depressed. And if we get depressed, you're actually seen stigmatized. And why? Because a coping mechanism for that is actually alcohol consumption, drug consumption. And that cycle of vicious vices, how it's seen in the Latino community, is basically close to, yeah, you're going to hell. You're going down the cycle. No, you become a bad migrant. You become ostracized from your community. You are not, you're not fulfilling that dream that I did to my mom, no? So you don't have time. And when you are, when you're allowed to have that level of alcohol consumption that you're allowed to cry and say, I don't know when I'm gonna see my mom again because my dad just died two, two weeks ago and I feel guilty that I cannot go to his, to his burial. And I didn't, actually I didn't buy him the towel he wanted, no? I'm just giving like these examples, but it's true. I've heard people saying that in my throughout my field work. So here it will be so easy to say, let's just go to therapy. No, <clears throat> let's just go to therapy. What are therapies for? Well, you go to therapy. You can work all your childhood trauma. You can go and work. I'm not diminishing therapy. I actually am pro therapy. We should all go to therapy in one way or another because we have to. We have to work it ourselves. But when is it when you cannot afford it? I'm not saying money-wise. I'm saying time-wise. What is like, you have your three-hour break. Those are the three hours that you have for yourself. You know, in between jobs and jobs. What do you do? You don't drive, you don't, you don't drive to, you know, you know about, there is this organization that's called Cruise, that is 
one on Lake Street and one in St. Paul in the Mexican, where the Mexican consulate is. And one of the main goals they're actually noticing is the access to mental, to health, to mental health for, for migrants. Is actually use pay 10 bucks to go to do your therapy, which is good. Do they have people? No. So they have hardly no population because most of them they're living in Bloomington, in Reedsville, Lake Street, uh, Brooklyn Parks, Worthington. They're not going to die not. They're not going to drive from their life, from their place of living to to St. Paul to have one hour of therapy or 45 minutes. They prefer to go and drink with their bodies, do like collective therapy a little bit, you know, cry and be a man and woman. Because the idea that women, like, you know, women don't drink. That is not true. Because they, they do drink. It's not like alcohol consumption, like, yes, we're getting drunk every Sunday. No. That's like casual drinking. We're having a, a copita. You know, we're having a glass of wine. We're having our, like, you know, um, I don't know how, what will be the, merch, the, the US version of that. But it's like spike juice, that's it. No? What? Exactly. So it's like, so it's just, a little bit of alcohol. Why? Because that's an, a social indicator. So that's why when in Mexico they think about migrants here, they're like, they, most of my Mexican migrants, they are in vices. They are in alcohol consumption. They're drinking. Why? Because that's the only way that they can cope sometimes in parties and celebrations. That way they don't break down. That way our suicide rate doesn't increase. In the last three years, who has tell me that what has happened in the last three years? Hmm? <laughs> political climate has changed. We're talking about different political climate. We're living in a different climate. <laughs> but our political climate has changed. What has, has happened? A lot of Mexican communities, Latino communities, have been persecuted constantly. So instead of getting drunk all the time, what they do is actually they start going to a lot of celebrations. They start dancing. They start talking. And yes, we can consume a beer or two. We're not saying that we're the alcoholic, but that's our only way of, instead of going to the downtown of La Plaza in the middle of the town, we actually have more time together. We spend time in our parties, in the things that we actually remind us of home. You know? In this, that I know, I know, I knew you when you were, when we were picking up our kids from school, when we were in kindergarten together. We know each other. And we are living here in this in this new home that we can call Minnesota. And that way our kids, they grow safe. They feel that they belong somewhere, you know? And that they don't have to suffer. That they're not hiding only in the, sh in the shadows. Because they're hiding in the shadows, not only for the, for the US government, for the oppression, but they're also hiding for the Mexican government. A lot of the Mexican government, they don't know. They're not that aware that there's a lot of Mexicans in Minnesota. Because uh, when they say, "Yeah, we mm -hmm. off, we have we offer we offer healthcare in groups next to the Mexican embassy," they don't know that the majority of the population they know for for numbers for recruiting their votes, mm -hmm. but they don't know that the majority is actually in Richfield and Bloomington. They go there for ask for their votes, but not to check on their community on how they're doing on how they actually are being remembered, how they're rooted. This, I love this example of this house. This is one of the houses that is part of what I call it the dream houses. What a lot of the people leave to build these kind of houses back down, right up to the town. And this is an, actually an element of how they actually make sure that they are present simultaneously in both places, in both communities, keeping the sanity of my mother, and you're still gonna be my mother, of my <laughs> mother, but also keeping their sanity here. That if I get sent back, I have a place to go. You know, I have a place where I can be rooted, that my kids can call home, even though they have a home here, but that they can be seen everywhere. Yeah.